Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Mark Becker, a podcast produced by Georgia State University. You can find this episode wherever you listen to podcasts. In this and future podcasts, I sit down with researchers and experts who can give us valuable and important information about the coronavirus pandemic. I hope you will find these conversations stimulating and thought-provoking, and if you do, please subscribe. Again, I'm your host, Georgia State President Mark Becker, and today my guest is Dr. Sally Wallace, the public finance economist and dean of the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State. Welcome, Dean Wallace. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Sally, you're a tax expert, and everyone complains about taxes. At the same time, they expect the public services that taxes provide, education, public health, roads, et cetera. And as we go through this historic period of economic deceleration associated with the pandemic, we see furloughs and layoffs leading to massive unemployment, which in turn leads to lower income tax collections. Uh, Sheltering in place orders or social distancing practices are resulting in people spending less money, therefore lower sales tax collections. And of course, less business activity means less business tax collections. So as we go through this, what do we know right now about state revenues and what might we expect to see over the next two to three months? Yeah, it's a it's a tough landscape out there. Um, The state of Georgia gets most of their revenue from income tax and sales tax. And both of those, as you said, are off because the economic activity just is not there. We're looking forward um, at the budget and I would anticipate that revenues will be off, you know, as much as 10, maybe a little bit more than 10% off of a $27 billion budget. It's a big hit. Big number. Absolutely. Uh, What what are the implications then for Georgians with lower tax collections and therefore less state revenue? The the state government, unlike the federal government, cannot uh, run a deficit. So they don't run out and borrow money. They can't print money. So they really need to look at their expenditures. And unfortunately, many of us understand very well that that means relatively large budget cuts across state agencies. Um, You know, you're leading us through that process at the university system and got to cut, got to cut expenditure someplace. Uh, Do you see that there are certain services that will just not be offered or do we just expect to see reductions? I'm sure that in some agencies, they will actually have to eliminate programs. I don't have have details across agencies for that, but in in many cases, we'll see cuts across all sorts of services, some deeper than others, um, looking for efficiencies where state and local governments can, and you know hopefully come out in, in a situation where we're we're stronger in terms of the efficiency of public services in the long term. So let's talk about the coming out, so to speak. I mean, this this particular recession, economic recession, is not so much a structural um, problem in the economy, but it's the result of a pandemic and a virus. And we know that eventually we will get beyond that, whether it's through vaccines or through herd immunity or whatever the concept may be, you know, the concepts we've talked about in other podcasts um, here. But what can we expect out of state and local revenues? What can we expect them to look like coming out of this pandemic and the associated economic crisis? Yeah, lots of people talk about, is this gonna be a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery that takes us some time? And in, in general, for instance, the state income tax revenue, the personal income tax is the largest revenue source. Not only is there a structural issue in terms of unemployment right now that's reducing the tax base, but we also have uh, deferred filing following the federal government. So whereas people would have typically filed in in April, we're gonna see that in July. So some of those revenues will catch up to us by by the fall. The big question is how much economic activity is going to come online that will um, sustain in particular the, the consumption taxes and then people getting back to work. Large scale unemployment, I think Georgia's hit 1.6 million um, unemployment claims. Some people may or may not realize that um, unemployment compensation is taxable under the income tax. So some of that may be regained over the next year as well. So you said we may be looking at state revenues at a 10% or even larger reduction. You know, does that come back in a year? What, what sort of time frame does it take for a state to recover from that kind of uh, loss, if you will, from revenues? I don't think anybody's gonna be happy with my, my projections on this. Over the last couple of years, state revenue has grown an average of four and a half percent per year. If we could 
reach um, um, the economy at a new point where we get back on that track, it'll still take us about four years to get back to where we were in FY20. So we're in for a long road uh, at this point, as I think is what you're saying. Yes, yep. Okay, so you know we're in a crisis and you, know, you hear this phrase bandied about a lot, um, the various talking heads like us, um, you know, never waste a crisis, and um, <laughs> it, as, as well as in a crisis, you, we also learn where the weak, weak links are in the chain, so to speak. And so what do you think we're learning about shortcomings and how we manage and provide public goods in this pandemic? And do you see opportunities for positive change resulting from what we're experiencing? That, that's a that's a great question, and and I'm I'm an optimist, so I'm hoping that we can harness this. There's a there's a lot of innovation in um, the use of artificial intelligence and other technologies that probably that that certainly can go a lot farther in in public service to increase the efficiency of provision of public services. You know, from simple things like automating processes for taking in paperwork, making decisions, to more sophisticated use of AI for policing and, and other services as well. So I think the silver lining here is we've all been standing at the edge of the pool waiting to harness this new technology. We've been pushed in and, and we might do very well to upgrade the public service from that perspective. So do you see that as, is that going to be a choice or a necessity? I mean, you, you think we're going to be in a situation where uh, governments are going to literally have to find uh, ways to leverage technologies to be more efficient? Or, is, or do you see that's going to be more of a choice? And, and, and if it's a choice, what are the consequences of not making the choice? Yeah, it's um, certainly at, at some level, it's a, it's a choice. The consequences of making a, a poor choice in terms of investing in that direction are that we will not be able to provide the level of public services that our citizenry will come to expect over time. So people, people are used to, to consuming via the internet. Um, they're used to the gig economy. If our public sector does not keep up with that type of production, um, it may be harder, for instance, to raise revenue, both because of structural reasons, but, but the citizenry wants to be able to consume public goods in the way that they think is most uh, reasonable and efficient as our economy changes. You mean here in Metro Atlanta, we actually want a highway transportation system that is efficient, for example? Yeah, <laughs> we won't get into details there. Very good. Well, you know, as we as we look to the future and what will happen to the public sector, I mean, counties, municipalities, as well as states and, and up to the federal level, you know, so obviously you see opportunities there. Uh, are there any examples that have already been employed and say in other countries where they've been able to make these sorts of uh, technological adaptations or structural changes in how they work so that they become more efficient and therefore more productive with the revenues they have available? Yes, um, the, the poster child for this, I think, is the country of Estonia, which has one of the most efficient uh, e-governance models around and, and has invested very heavily for about 20 years. So there's a lot to learn there. Um, you and I were talking earlier about Denmark. Denmark has information um, that allows them to service and provide services throughout the, the life cycle of, of individuals with relatively low cost ways of doing that. And yes, you know, for example, might the day come when we don't even have to file an income tax form because they basically just collect it and they know they got it right? That, that would that, be nice. That would be awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. You know, and, and even think of Estonia. I, I had the good pleasure of visiting Estonia in the 1990s. And suffice it to say, it was not a model of efficiency. It was still uh, representing a lot of the examples of the um, the structure of, should we say, the Soviet um, structure and state. So you know, that ability, and, and they're in a small country to change, but really sometimes when you are in a, in a crisis or in a situation where you're, where you're not so wedded to the past, and, that, and a crisis can do that for you, you really do get those opportunities, whether it's to make technological or policy changes. And yeah, yeah. Do you see greater appetite for policy change in times of crisis like this? Again, I, cert I certainly hope so. Um, and there's all sorts of directions for, for this to go in, including um, public-private partnerships for many years were very popular as ways to spread risk between government and the private sector, but also to be able to invest in cases where revenues 
public revenues weren't there. I would love to see a resurgence in some some work on what are effective public private partnerships where the where the public sector is not taking on all the risk, but it's actually spread between these partners. So do you have an example of a public private partnership that seems to have worked somewhere that you think might be applicable, say here in Georgia or across the US? Um, I think some of the best cases are the, the various interstates in, in New Jersey and um, Delaware, as well as other places where, where you see um, an, an effective partnership work. I think, I think to some extent, if I may, the partnership that Georgia State has developed with some of our other partners is a, is a version of that that, um, to me, looks like it has worked quite well. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's pivot for a moment to the federal level. So as we go through this, we've seen multiple stimulus packages by the federal government, uh, massive borrowing, trillions of dollars, uh, just to keep the economy afloat, you know, so that we don't go into something that looks much more like a depression uh, than the recession we're already experiencing. Do you see an economic reckoning coming uh, for all that borrowing at some point? Yeah, um, the, the federal government obviously has different ways to, to spread, to deal with its debt, but the, the massive amounts that are um, coming forth in, I guess we have three and a half uh, bills right now that have, have uh, put trillions of dollars into the economy. I, I do foresee in the next six to 18 months um, some pressure on interest rates as potential crowding out from the federal government engaging in, in the debt relative to the, to the private sector. So do you mean inflation? Is that, is that what you mean by interest rates? Some bit of inflation, yep, and, and upward pressure on, on borrowing and, and therefore the cost of investing. So you don't see a risk of deflation of negative interest rates in the, in the immediate, uh, in the foreseeable future? I, I don't, I don't. I know there's been a lot of conversation about that because of the, the lack of uh, um, robust consumption, but I don't see that lasting very long. And I think people, you know, J Japan has experienced that previously. And I think when we saw negative oil prices, um, it sort of shook people a little bit. That was hopefully was a very short term experience. And that's yeah, yeah. Talk about a roller coaster. And that's the oil prices and the gas prices are another um, hit on especially state and local government revenues because of what we were not getting from the gas tax. Right. So we're all enjoying paying less for our gas. And, and most of us are using a lot less gas than we normally use. But that's yet another hit on state revenues and, and therefore the public sector. So, you know, you and I both are old enough to have lived through the Great Recession, in fact, to work here at Georgia State through the Great Recession. And, uh, you know, a lot happened then as well. Um, states took big budget hits. The federal government had to wade into this world. So how, how has federal and state tax policy, both during the Great Recession as well as since, helped hurt or prepare us for the situation we find ourselves in today? Unfortunately, it's one of the lessons I think that we did not learn in the Great Recession, which is that we have an antiquated tax system that continues to essentially ignore that we're a service-based economy where a lot of our consumption happens on the, on the internet. Um, so something that, that we tax nerds call tax handles, you know, where you can get out and, and actually touch uh, that, that revenue source, those are getting more and more difficult. And we have not made really structural changes to our tax system that could increase long term our sustainability in terms of public finances. So you know, if we look back in history, the last time we had what I'll call massive changes in, in public projects, one of the, the, the one of the historic examples is all the way back to the New Deal, which followed the Great Depression, or a series of programs which included public works projects, financial reforms as well as regulations, you know, some, some of the kinds of things we're talking about, but in a different con time and context, were all enacted under um, the, the Roosevelt administration, Franklin Roosevelt's administration, over a period of years, 1933 to 39. Uh, but it was responded to the needs for relief, reform, and recovery from, you know, a, a great economic crisis, the Great Depression. Do you see potential or opportunity for a 21st century New Deal following this pandemic? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I do see potential, but of a of a very different type of New Deal. So the the uh, digital New Deal, where if the government were to move in that direction, what I would love to see is, and you know, we're not going to be um, 
digging ditches and filling potholes and building new roads, but rather that we invest in uh, technology and upskilling people. We have this massive number of people churning through the unemployment system right now. Let's let's take advantage and, and get them ready for this, this economy that we're living in right now, computer science skills, um, basic digitization and, and data skills as well. I would love to see the government take a serious look at investing in that way. It's, you know, it's interesting if we think about all the technological change that we've been so fortunate to experience in our lives, um, and particularly since the late 1990s, so over the last 20 years from, you know, went from computers becoming a normal part of life up through and to AI today, a lot of that has been driven by, uh, if you will, efficiency gains, uh, whether it's personal efficiency, such as I can deposit a check in my bank account by taking a picture of it. I don't have to go to the bank to do it. Um, obviously, companies with uh, whether it's enterprise uh, software systems to be more efficient in their processes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How do states or counties or cities, exp you know, what what can drive them to, in a sense, you know, really do the sorts of things you're talking about to become more efficient? Where are their incentives? Their, their incentives are in lowering the cost of public services. You know, we, we have been through decades of uh, concern over the growth and the level of tax revenues. So how can, how can state and local governments perform quality services at a lower cost? And I'm a strong believer in that um, AI and technology led productivity gains in the state and local sector where we can learn a lot from what's happened in the private sector. Well, that, that's terrific, Sal. I really appreciate your insights. This has been you know, fascinating. And you know, because of the territory that we covered, uh, it's all relevant not only to today, but not for the next few months and the next few years. So I um, certainly um, look forward to uh, continuing to follow this with you and hope that um, in the future you'll be willing to come back as we uh, start to get a greater sense of where we are and where we might be going. And hopefully a greater sense of how we're going to be able as a society to realize some of these opportunities that you shared with us today. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the public sector. Thank you. Well, this has been Conversations with Mark Becker, a podcast produced by Georgia State University. And you've been listening to a conversation with Dean Sally Wallace, public finance economist, and as I said, Dean of the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University. To hear future conversations with experts on the front lines of addressing the coronavirus crisis, you'll find conversations with Mark Becker wherever you listen to podcasts. We're going to take a break from these podcasts next week, and you can expect our next episode in early June. Thank you for listening, and remember to subscribe so that you will not miss future episodes. Goodbye for now.